And this is the Y'all Show Talk with a Southern Accent. John Rawl here as we begin another week talking about the South. And we've got a very special guest that we're going to have on not only this segment of the Y'all Show, but he's going to stick around and we'll have him back in the second hour of the program. And our next guest is certainly not a newcomer to me. He and I go back nearly 20 years. Welcome into the Y'all Show, a actor, a singer, and a, just a great Southerner, Rick Revel. Hello. Rick. Hey, brother. How are you? Good Man, to see you it's again. Good to see you. Let me been shake a long your time, hand. It, ha- it has been a long time. Uh-huh. Rick, <laughs> we're going to learn more about his very colorful background hmm. from working with the coal miner's daughter yes. to what you've done in schools throughout the year. And then I, think, I don't think I mentioned Rick's an author and has hmm. got the In the Hills of Tennessee that he's going to talk about and great music as well. And you and I go back to around 2002. Yes. I was filming a documentary called Rebel Forest about General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And you and I worked together on that. And that yeah. was a great time. Rick provided the theme song for that show, Ride with the Devil. Yes. And, and that documentary yes. that I was able to direct was in a couple of different film festivals. Knoxville, Tennessee, wow. Memphis, Tennessee, Oxford, Mississippi. And I really appreciate everything yeah. you did. We, we, we had a lot Glad of people see that. And that's available on YouTube. You can search for Rebel Forest. Go to the website, rebelforest.com. In fact, while I'm sitting here bragging about it, yeah. why don't we uh, let Everybody. people see a little bit of yeah. some of the footage there. And also, you, uh, you might not be able to hear it, but this music there, the theme song, Ride with the Devil, mm-hmm. as we had a, a great great presentation of that with all the reenactors. And, and your theme song there was a big part of rebel for so how in the world did you kind of you do music but you do music and acting too more from a historic standpoint when i I first started out john it was kind of one of those things that uh you know i wanted to always be on the grand ole opry and do it the conventional country music route and but my dad and my uncle and uh different ones in the family they admired a an artist called johnny horton and of course johnny horton got his uh, start doing honky-tonk music but somewhere along the way, he started doing historical ballads, like the Battle, Battle of New Orleans and things like that. And, and Johnny Reb. Johnny Reb, which was written by Merle Kilgore, which oh. was Hank Jr.'s former manager. Paris, Tennessee. Paris, Tennessee. So, and he was a next-door neighbor at one time. So <laughs> it was kind of cool. I went to visit uh, Merle one day, and, and he told me the dilemma with the Johnny Reb song. We were already getting into PC times, and, and so uh, he said that Warner Brothers had pulled pulled the record that uh the album that uh, hank had uh, he had put out johnny reb and they actually pulled the album because it had that song on it so they took it out of out of production and wouldn't sell it anymore which really made merle mad and he said some he said hoss would you cut that song for me and i said sure so what, what year are we talking about when there was a problem oh lord we're looking back in the, the uh late 1990s going into the 2000s so you're looking back that far that warner brothers had already pulled his album because it had johnny rib on it one song one song pulled the whole album because it had that one song on it so you're looking back late 1990 might have been 2000 2001 somewhere in that period pull that rascal because when i cut um ride with the devil i cut uh, johnny rib near that same time so okay. So it was close to that same time, same and time period. Johnny Rev, I mentioned that song because it really was one of, I would say, the top five songs in Johnny Horton's discography. Yes, it was. Yes. yes, it was. And it was, and, and, and just about everybody where I go traveling across the country now know that. When I mention Johnny Horton, that's one of the songs they'll say, Sink the Bismarck, Johnny Rev, and Battle of New Orleans. That's the three that they, most people can name that Johnny Horton used to sing. So um, it's one of his most popular songs. Well, you have not only the ability to talk about the Civil War, but also Revolutionary War. Mm-hmm. And again, Rick Revel is our guest. He's not only a singer, but you also do acting and more. And I think you kind of helped get into this genre, <laughs> working with the coal miner's daughter, Loretta mm, Yes, Lynn. Yes, I did. I started out uh, as her entertainment manager there at Loretta Lynn's Dude Ranch, and I was there about three years. And from that... Uh, as an entertainment manager, she said, what type of entertainment can you add to our... Nah, she didn't say it like that. Give me a Loretta well, voice. Honey. <laughs> well, if my, after she fixed me a ham sandwich at her house, honestly, she said, honey, he said, what can you do to spice things up? She'd already seen my campfire show and she loved it, but she said, you have a free reign, add other things to it. And so I did. 
I started doing the old West gunfights, and Wild Bill Hickok happened to be one of the characters that I picked out to uh, to recreate and started doing that, and uh, that was one of the first characters I ever did portray was Hickok. But then my daughter came home after um, years passed from that event, and uh, my daughter came home from uh, brought her fifth grade homework for Daddy to kind of help her with, and it was supposed to be about history. And so I sit down and I look at what was supposed to be your history lesson and I go, this is not the full story. This is abbreviated. And it was about George Washington. Then I looked at the section on the Civil War and it was very abbreviated. So I kind of, it was a put up and shut up moment. And I mentioned Merle Kilgore earlier. When I sit down and visited with him, I told him I was wanting to do a whole new genre. And, cre- and I was kind of creating. Did you call my name? <laughs> John Rawl? <laughs> John Rawl. Yeah. But uh, it was kind of funny about trying to uh, do a new genre. He said, what will you call it? And I said, well, it's a cross between education and entertainment. So I called it edutainment. And so he, he laughed and he said, Hoss, you're on to something there. He said, it's better to be a, a, a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. That was his very words. And I thought it was pretty cool. And then he's you're just a regular old Mr. History, aren't you? And I said, <laughs> well, I've never thought about that. And so those two things started to stick. And uh, not that I know everything about history, but I think it was my passion for history. So after that, I began to really focus on it. Uh, started uh, developing a show around George Washington and David Crockett and, and started doing schools across the state of Tennessee and Kentucky, Missouri, and different places. And it began to catch on. And so... From that, my interest in American history continued to grow, and I wound up um, meeting a gentleman called Tom McKinney. We'll talk about more of that later, but he's the one that got me involved in writing books. So that's how everything got, began to evolve and blossom. Um, the acting part, uh, it actually uh, helped me to get a part in a movie with Robert Redford called A Walk in the Woods. And it was because of they wanted a Civil War scene in their movie that winds up falling on the edit floor and never made it but I got a chance to be in a movie with Robert Redford called A Walk in the Woods him and Nick Nolte so it's amazing what your little history journey will take you on sometimes this This is is the Y'all Show with John Rawl and Rick Revel is our very special guest you can find this interview and so much more at y'all.com the ultimate guide to the south and Rick as I said at the start of this interview he and I go back nearly 20 years yes and has done a wonderful job portraying these characters throughout history we're going to talk a little bit more detail in hour two about this specific book called in the hills of Tennessee Rick great job thank you I mean you talk about a renaissance man author singer actor (laughs) and a just a great southerner and we're going to continue our discussion again in hour two but Going back, Rick, with you, as far as your singing style, when did you kind of first realize that the singing of historic figures, there's a need for that? I think that actually did begin more into the 1990s, mid-1990s, once my children got into school, and I began to develop this whole new edutainment genre, as I call it. Um, I had been doing country music straight on. Uh, You know, We'd mentioned the album earlier. Most everything I had done... Uh, in Nashville was pretty much straight country music but when I got into involved in doing these ballads um, I kind of adopted the Johnny Horton philosophy of taking a history item uh, an idea and actually turning it into something fairly commercial so not only will it entertain somebody and tickle their ear Mm -hmm. but they'll be learning something at the same time and you know um, when you had you, your Y'all magazine, you allowed me to, uh, you did an article on me there. And it was amazing, some of the people in, in Y'all magazine, when they responded back, they, they were saying, there's a need for this. And that's the thing I discovered. There's a huge need for somebody to tell our country's story because it's being overlooked. It's not being taught in our schools. We may kid ourselves and fool ourselves to think that it is. But history, American history as we know it, it's not being taught in our schools today. And that's one thing, Rick, that you actually did go into schools yes. and teach, and you got resistance. Yes, Therefore, it did. Therefore, you're hardly doing that at all anymore. Yeah, and, and because they call it a monopoly, because it became so popular, 
that I was booking schools. I had five different characters that I did, and I was booking schools uh, five years in a row, and then that same school want me that sixth year, and I just start rotating the characters all over again because there was an overturn in students, and uh, began to do that, and the uh, the people at the state of Tennessee over the Arts Council said it was monopoly, and I said, no, you monopolize somebody by forcing them to do it, or by buying them up, or forcing them to to do this particular situation. This was the choice of the school officials, the local principal, those people that said, I want you back at my school. But the uh, Arts Council come out and said, I cannot do shows two years in a row. They made that ruling. If I did a school this year, next year I can't do that show again. I can't do that school again. I have to skip a year. Then I complied with that and uh, still was booking several shows. And then they said, all right, we're going to get real smart. We're going to deny the money. So they started denying the money and telling the schools there was no funding for my show. But they could get funding for the clown that does the balloon art <laughs> <laughs> or the magician, but they couldn't get George Washington or David Crockett. What were the, so characters, the characters you did or, and still do? Um, Meriwether Lewis is one of my uh, favorites, but George Washington, Meriwether, all-time favorite. Meriwether Lewis of Lewis and Clark Of fame. Lewis and Clark, so I talk about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Who died in Middle Tennessee, but Meriwether, and was, I think, murdered in Middle Tennessee, right? I say murdered, some say suicide. But how do you commit suicide with a single shot pistol and load it twice and shoot yourself twice with it? You just don't do that. But they say suicide. The official is supposed to be suicide, but I think he was robbed and murdered. And that was in Hohenwald, Tennessee? Near there, yes. And On part of the Natchez Trace where State Park. Where was he from? Um, you got me on where he was not from. Tennessee, right? Not Tennessee, but see, he was coming back from Louisiana. On the he was, he, Trace. he was the governor uh, of that territory at the time, and he was coming back to Louisiana. So that's where he was living at the time. Okay. And so he was born in, in the colonies early on, but he kind of migrates around the country. And because of his popularity, he's, he's assigned to be the governor of the Lu Louisiana Territory. And so he's on his way back from that and had $300 in his belt, and uh, the money was missing. And so that was my theory that he was not, it was not suicide. You don't think a woman had something to do? I, with you it. never know. You never know. But there was a, there was a woman there actually present that told the story, and said it she it was suicide. So they uh, they took. Of course, course she we, said that. Because we don't have you know we don't there was no corners back then. That darn Meriwether Lewis, I'll tell you. Yeah. So he's one of your characters. You said George Washington. George Washington to do David Crockett, uh, Hickok, and I used to do uh, who uh, Hickok. Wild Bill Hickok. Oh, well, okay. Wild Bill. And then I did uh, Captain Todd Carter from the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee. Okay. And he was a uh, war correspondent. He was uh, known as the Mint Julep. And I uh, did a series of articles on him for the Civil War Courier magazine. Developed that into a book. It was one of my first books. And um, But I thought he'd be a, a very interesting character. Long story short, he leaves uh, in um, May of 61. He musters into the Army. Leaves with the Army of Tennessee, is gone, as the story goes, the entire time until the Army of Tennessee is back at Franklin, Tennessee, uh, November 30th, 1864, for the Battle of Franklin. So he literally has gone the whole time, comes back, and he's at his home when the Battle of Franklin is fought and killed True, in his back door. Yeah, truly on his home property. Killed within 100, 100 yards. yards of the back door of his home. And Todd it's called, I thought, you know, follow me, boys, I'm going home. And that's supposedly the last thing they heard him say. Follow me, boys, I'm going home. Mm. And he led the charge. Unfortunate. So many lives lost in the war yes. between the states. And you do a wonderful job, again, accentuating various characters from both the 18th century, the 19th century, and, Thank and more. Rick Rebel is our special guest here on today's Y'all Show. We're not done with Rick. He's going to come back on in hour two, and we're going to talk a little bit more about his new book, yep. In the Hills of Tennessee. And if you want a true story of adventure and there's no way that could possibly be the case then you need to know about jack henson who lived in the land between the lakes area of kentucky and tennessee yep. and he almost kind of had his own war i think the yep. name of the book one man war came out many years ago and your book is a different take on that 
and we're going to talk to Rick about that and learn a little bit more about his other project. Rick Revel coming back on in hour two, plus an hour two on today's Y'all Show. We'll start it off with a look back at the weekend in sports, a little golf news, a little XFL news, and more. Plus, in hour two, Jerry Short is going to have his Takapola story time. All that coming up right here. You ever heard of Takapola? <laughs> yeah, I just did. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad word. It's not a bad word. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. I'm going to look it up. <laughs> all that is coming up in hour two of this, the show that's all about the South. This is y'all. All right. And then we're going to skip forward now to hour two. Okay. <clears throat> that's good. Thank you all for watching. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this, this is the Y'all Show. Welcome back in to the All Southern Program. Jerry Short, the Takapola <clears throat> Storyteller, is going to be coming up at the end of this hour. Make sure you stick around for old Jerry and what is on his mind these days. We've got a great storyteller, but this guy doesn't just make up stuff. He's got true history that he writes about, he sings about, and he even acts about it. Rick Revel is our very special guest on today's Y'all Show. And Rick's joining us right here on today's Y'all program. And we had him on in hour one. If you missed that, make sure you go find our archives at y'all.com or go to YouTube and see that original interview from hour one. But right now, carrying on with Rick for another segment here on Y'all. And Rick is an actor, a singer, and author of In the Hills of Tennessee. And when did you finish this book? Uh, this book came out uh, April of last year on the soft cover pre, pre-release, but officially it was released in July uh, 30th, right at August 1st of last year's when the hardcover came out. This is a, uh, it's kind of a different way to put out a, a book like this. Most uh, books considered historic fiction or something of this nature, usually they don't include a lot of illustrations, but we... We included about a hundred different illustrations in the book. I wanted people not only, because it's kind of, I, I wanted to write a, a historically accurate book. But when, but when Tom, Tom wrote the biography, Tom McKinney. The biography uh, of, uh, of Captain Jack, Jack Henson. Jack Henson. It was uh, called One Man's War. And when he wrote the biography, it was one of those things to where it covered most everything in Jack's life. And as I began to do some research for a movie script, he asked me to do a movie script about his book. As I began to do that, and, and like your video that we did, Ride with the Devil. Rebel Forest. Rebel RebelForest.com. Forest. And also you can watch it on YouTube. Just search Rebel Forest, a documentary yeah. about Nathan Bedford Forrest and Rick Rebel and his yeah. great song, Ride with the Devil, the mm-hmm. featured song in that project. Well, now just, back to you. Well, just like that, I had written a song about his book called The Ballad of Captain Jack. And I wanted to play it for him, so I found him at a, a reenactment and uh, played it for him, and he fell in love with the song. And we began, uh, he said, you know, can I use that song to promote my book? And I said, well, sure, you can use the song to promote your book. Just take me with you, and I'll sing the song live. So we started doing that and traveling some. Through that, I, uh, we talked about doing a movie script, because I said, your book would make a great movie. So he challenged me to do a movie script, and I did so. And... As you do a movie script, you create dialogue and the narrative. So as I created the dialogue, he kind of fell in love with that part of it. He said, you know, I may have brought Jack Henson to life, but you gave him a voice. And I said, well, hmm, this is interesting. I give this, uh, this character a voice. And he said, can you take this now and, and create a historic fiction novel? And so that's what I've done. I've taken... And, and, and some of the things that Tom mentioned back to me as I told him things in the script, I found not only, he talks about in his book, the men that killed his sons, but he kept calling them that lieutenant, but he never did name them. And I asked him why he didn't. He said, well, I never found their names. But in my research for the movie script, I found who I think were the men that did it. So in my book, In the Hills of Tennessee, not only do I tell you about the men that killed the sons, but I actually named them because I found them in the historical records, the muster rolls of the unit they belong to. Um, for those, those that don't, don't know the story, in, in a nutshell... It's a fascinating story. I, and a guy like myself who 
is an admirer of War Between the States, a.k.a. Civil War history. I've never heard of anything like Jack Henson until this one-man war came out many years ago, and now your book is accentuating the Jack Henson story. Yeah. And, and we, ex- we extend on it completely. Um, it, what's amazing about it, a man that tried to remain neutral, uh, he tried his best to stay out of the war, although one of his sons did join the 14th Tennessee that winds up in Virginia with Robert E. Lee. Jack himself tries to remain neutral because he had, he had started, it was a rag to riches story, he started out very poor and by the time the war starts he's 56 years old. And so he's kind of settled by now and he's kind of used to having some form of wealth. He wasn't rich, but he had accumulated some wealth. And so he didn't want to lose that because of the war. So he became very protective, but he got to know Gideon Pillow, a southern officer, a general for the southern army. He got to know Ulysses S. Grant. He got to know Grant. He got to know both of them because of him mingling and getting to know people. But what winds up happening, him trying to remain neutral did not work. There was a group called the Irish Dragoons, which were part of the 5th Iowa Cavalry. They took a disliking for the family. Jack, and this is something Tom didn't know in his in, in his research, I found where Jack actually owned a, a store called Henson's Grocery Shop there in, in Dover, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee area. And the Irish Dragoons wind up burning that store. And they burned this store during August of 62, which you'll find out in the book why, why it winds up getting burned. And what winds up happening, those two sons that ran the store, which remained as civilians, they didn't join either army, they go home because they, the store has been burned. And while they're out on a squirrel hunt in the fall of 62, the Irish Dragoons, which already despises the Henson family, find these two boys squirrel hunting. The commander of the 5th Iowa Cavalry, Colonel William Lowe, had put out the order that if they found any bushwhackers, that they could actually, on the spot, kill the bushwhackers. Because they had this vendetta against the Hensons, mm-hmm. they found the two boys with guns, squirrel hunting. They rode up with their sharps carbines pointed at them, disarmed the boys, took them out, tied them to a tree, shot them, execution style. Then they took the bodies down, laid them across a stump, beheaded them, put their heads in a tow sack tied the feet of the two headless bodies, drug them back to the courthouse at Dover, hung them upside down on an oak tree in front of the courthouse. Then they rode out, after leaving the bodies displayed, they ride out to Jack's house and post both of the heads on the gatepost of his picket fence. Golly. And so that's when Jack changed. His neutrality vanishes. And he goes and gets a special made rifle and he takes after the men that killed his sons. And he ended up having, again, a one-man war of which he's supposed to have killed how many people? Well, on his, the notches or the kill dots on his rifle, there were 36, and that's the officers alone. About 130 total is roughly what I can find. <laughs> and this is all true. This is, not- this is from one man, and he would go down to the Tennessee River from a bluff uh, is one of the most infamous places, and from that bluff, he would fire down. It, it was a place called the um, Towhead Chute, and because of the uh, direction the boats were traveling, they got into the, the current, which was working against the boat, and slowed it down. They were going against the current in a very na- narrow vent, uh, ventura, yeah. and so as they went through there, the boat almost come to a standstill, running wide open and almost come to a standstill, so Jack would get up on this bluff, and he would shoot down in there, and he would pick out the officers, the captains of the boat. And so, so it's pretty incredible, but he not only did it at that spot, he did it at several spots along the Tennessee, Cumberland River, both, all the way up through the uh, land between the lakes area. And again, your book, In the Hills of Tennessee, yes, is out now covering this yep. story and a fantastic read. And i got to give you proper credit. This book is not skinny at all. It's about 400 pages. 418 pages. Well-researched, well-written. And it chronicles Captain Jack Henson in the land between the lakes area of and Kentucky, Tennessee. can find it at rickrevel.com. Just simply go to rickrevel.com, and that's where you can find the book on my website at rickrevel.com. 
Rick, in addition to writing great books, you also are involved, as we said, with acting. Yep. And I found you on YouTube recently with something you did there along the Kentucky-Tennessee border. I believe it's Stewart County. You, yes. You've done some work with. What, what was that all about, speaking of the land between the lakes well, area? It's kind of cool. When I uh, Right after the book came out, I went to the uh, local Chamber of Commerce in Stewart County. I'm a member there in Stewart County, Tennessee. And uh, went to the county mayor, and I said, you know, you have such a beautiful area, and, and history thrives here. Why not do some uh, tourist videos to say, this is what we have, so you can get people to come see your beauty uh, and the history that's, that's, uh, that beholds the county. And he said, that's a great idea. So we wound up the very first one that we did was there at the old home place. And uh, what's neat about it, uh, a lot of the old buildings there uh, were there before um, they built the Kentucky Lake. So a lot of the, the home place is actually the old homestead that was there. So a lot of it's a lot of old original buildings, and so we get a chance to uh, go there and uh, tell people about what they're going to see when they come to the home place. We also did one on Fort Donaldson and did two more about the county, and I'm portraying uh, David Crockett or the Tennessean and a couple of them, and I enjoy doing Crockett. He's one of my one of my great characters. He was he's he's funny. I love some of his humor. And this is called The Home Place at Land Between the Lakes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you can find that on YouTube. And, yep. again, you not only appear there in character, but you do a little singing, I believe. Yeah, from time I, pl I played the there. banjo, a song that uh, I've, actually that's a piece of the song, one of the songs that, uh, uh, that I've written called In the Hills of Tennessee, which is another song I've written about uh, Jack Henson. And I sing that uh, In the Hills of Tennessee song on the front porch of that cabin right there. All right. Well, it looks like a beautifully well-done production there in Stewart County, Tennessee, with the scenery there. And, again, if you don't know where this is, if you look at the map of Tennessee and Kentucky, this is in the western portion of Tennessee, but it's really technically middle Tennessee as it's on the east side of the Tennessee River, but sandwiched between the Tennessee and the Cumberland River as well, you'll find yes. Stewart County. And it borders the state of Kentucky, I guess, Fulton – no, not Fulton uh, – Murray, Kentucky is not far. Not far from there. From right. there. And it's a lovely area with a lot of, it looks like rustic cabins and stuff like that. And, and this video, a great effort there by you to illustrate what's going on there in that part of, of Tennessee. Tennessee. And how much singing did you do in this particular production? <laughs> uh, just the one song in that particular piece. Actually, I play uh, a couple of the banjo tracks in there. Background music. I'm playing the banjo and some of the background tracks as I did in several of those of the four videos they uh, for the Stewart County tourism and the uh, county mayor they won an award they entered these into a Tennessee contest and from the state of Tennessee and we actually won an award for did it you? so Again, it's pretty cool the home place at land between the lakes there you are playing yeah. your, your banjo are you a pretty good banjo player I just I, I bang on it I, I, I do it uh, I do it the old style I just uh, do it more like they would have done it back in the 1800s. Um, Five-string banjo today, how they play it in bluegrass style, is totally different than how it was played in the 1800s. So I try to do it more as if it was played like in the 1800s. So. Yeah, well. I'm more envious. the Stephen Foster style. Ah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm envious of what you can do there on the banjo, and I guess you're a pretty good gu guitar picker. Geeter. Too. I'm a guitar player. Yeah, I enjoy playing guitar. Yeah. Yeah. And I play electric guitar, too. I do that. I do play a lot of contemporary Christian music, also. Do you really? Yeah. I, again, Rick Revel, a man of so many talents, and he's an author in the hills of Tennessee. Check it out. This is available at rickrevel.com. Rickrevel.com. And uh, I think the book lady here has a few copies, so the book lady in Jackson has some. Okay. And we're supposed to at uh, Casey Jones Museum. They're going to start handling it. Sometime in the next, very near future. What about Amazon? Not yet. We're working on that. Okay. We are working on that. And you are already got other books in the can. Yes, got two more in the can. So, Like I said, a man who <laughs> never sleeps. Do you, do you sleep? Uh, well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and like I said, he's got the, the acting thing as well. We, we've seen that there in that example of what you did there in Stewart County. County. And, and then it. what you do from a singing standpoint and... Your CDs are also available at rickrevel.com? Yes, sir. And uh, you, you can actually go to Spotify and if you want to just listen to them or download from Spotify or your favorite uh, music platform. Uh, it's on about uh, 15 different music platforms. So this album is out there, Making It in America. If you'd like to hear some of my music, just go to Spotify or your favorite 
music platform, and there it is. Yeah, and as I said, Rick Rebel's style is unique. He's doing something that's important right now. History has been sent to the back of the classroom and often and never gets discussed, and, and frankly, right. the way I think it should be discussed. And with your characters from Meriwether Lewis to George Washington and some of your Civil War era figures as well, you're doing an, an incredible job, and we hope that that continues, Rick, going forward. Can, can I say one thing you on may. the contemporary standpoint? If, if we wonder why American history is important, let's take a snapshot of what has just happened for the past few weeks and months in this presidential election we're facing. There is something called socialism that is being pushed. <laughs> and I will tell you the reason for that is because we have not been teaching true American history in our classrooms. We've been teaching abbreviated or totally revised versions of American history. We're not teaching true American history. And if you don't if you think I'm not telling you the truth, we would have never been in the place we are in presently in our politics. I can't prove this is true, but you can maybe prove what I was told the other day. I just literally got told us that there is a mindset, if not already, it's already being acted upon, that history classes in certain school districts start after World War II. Have you heard that? They, they, first they were doing it after the Civil War, and now they, they keep t uh, setting up the, time, the, the chronological timetable even further to where they're not even getting a chance to find out anything about uh, I, I would say, you know, World War II is going to be something that they won't even study in the next few years. They're trying to get it to where everything is being wiped totally from our uh, the minds of the children. So they're if 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 they don't know, if they're ignorant about the founding of our country, then they're just not going to know how to vote, and they can be swayed far more easily. So it's it's a systematic process that we're going through. And Rick, at your website, rickrebel.com, you have point of contact information. If people yes. want to book you, if they want to talk to you, if they think what you're doing needs to be applied in their portion of the South, yes. you, you welcome that feedback. Yes, I do. And I'd love to come speak to your Rotary, your any type of civic club, Lions Club, any of your civic clubs. I've spoken at many over the past year. Uh, I spoke two weekends ago at the local uh, Daughters of American Revolution. We did their program. We, I, I was George Washington, and I... I spoke on his birthday to the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, and and they now have uh, the uh, Children of the American Revolution, a new generation of program they're working with to actually try to teach some of the young ones true American history. And it's it's good to see organizations like the DAR out there trying to do something positive for American history. We need more of that. We sure do. Rick RickRevel.com is the website. Rick, I really appreciate you coming on the Y'all Show and telling us a little bit more about what you've got going on within the hills of Tennessee and the other great work all available. You can see it at RickRevel.com. We're going to go to break here on the Y'all Show with a blast from the past. Rick, a little ride with the devil. Yeah. Can't thank you enough for coming on. Hey, don't go anywhere. Jerry Short, the other storyteller, the guy that actually makes up stuff from time <laughs> to time, he's going to be on after the break here on the Y'all Show. You don't want to miss that, as this is the program that's all about the South. This is Y'all. And again, thank you very much, Rick. Good to be here. On the Bless day you. after the Battle of Shiloh, the rebels were falling back real slow. No William to come to Sherman. Three brigades of men Thought he might attack those rebels once again You know he wants to fight <laughs> He's about to get one <laughs> but There's one man that stood in Sherman's way He said, Yankee, this just ain't your day Well, Nathan Bedford Forrest, 300 by his side Said, boys it's time to ride.